option pricing basics. Let's break it all down into some bite-sized chunks. Let's go. Hey, Jim Schultz here with you guys for F Cubed and Live, fcubed.com. And here on the channel, we do fitness content, we do faith content, we do finance content. So if any of those appeal to you, or even all of those appeal to you, then hit that subscribe button, tap the bell, and that way you won't miss anything. All right, so this is the thing that is the most fundamental part of options, pricing. It's going to determine your success or lack thereof when it comes to trading the options market. Now, we've already covered moneyness, which is pretty important. We've already covered how you even make money when you sell options, which is arguably even more important since, I mean, hey, that is the reason why we're all here. And I'll link to those videos down in the description. But option pricing always comes back to an option pricing model. Now, the poster child of all option pricing models is the Black-Scholes option pricing model. It was developed by Fisher Black and Myron Scholes with a huge shout out, a ton of help provided by Robert Merton. And it was officially published back in 1973 in the Journal of Political Economy. And it has obviously withstood the test of time, which is evidenced by the simple fact that here we are still talking about it in July of 2022. But effectively, what the Black-Scholes model does is it breaks an option price down into its component parts, and it solves for what those component parts should be. Now, with an options price, there's only two main, really two only, component parts. There's intrinsic value and extrinsic value. Now, the intrinsic value is actually pretty simple, and we talked about this in the moneyness video that I referenced earlier. You don't really need an elegant mathematical model to crank out an intrinsic value. I'm pretty confident that your fingers should get you where you're trying to go. An option is in the money by one, two, three, four dollars. You have intrinsic value of one, two, three, four dollars. An option is in the money by seven dollars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have intrinsic value of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. An option isn't in the money. You don't need any fingers because you don't have any intrinsic value. All right, easy enough. But the other side of the option pricing story with extrinsic value is not so simple, and this is where the Black-Scholes model really shines. It's able to take the six relevant variables, the stock price, the strike price, the implied volatility, the time, the dividends, the interest rate, figure out the extrinsic value, tack that onto the intrinsic value, and then churn out the options price all within a nanosecond or two. Now, of these six variables, there are really only four that matter. The stock price, the strike price, time, and volatility. Dividends and interest rates, they kind of matter a little bit, but they don't really matter a lot of bit. I mean, it's kind of like when you're cooking. It's salt, fat, acid, and heat. Like, those are going to be the drivers. The paprika matters, but not as much as the butter. The bell pepper matters but not as much as the poblano pepper. Exact same idea here. Now, some of you out there thinking, Jim, my dude, like I need a little bit more. I knew all that coming in, so give me a little bit more to chew on. All right, I got you, boo-boo. Let's peel back that onion a few extra layers. Let's start with time, and let's examine time's relationship with extrinsic value a little bit more closely. Without getting into time's nonlinearity or time's specific impact on other variables, the relationship between time and extrinsic value is actually pretty straightforward. If time goes up, extrinsic value also goes up. If time goes down, extrinsic value also goes down. In isolation, ceteris paribus, for all my Latin scholars out there in the crowd today, this will always be what you observe. And the reasoning why this is the case should be clear if we go back to the origin of the contract itself, the buyer and the seller. Remember that the option buyer effectively buys the contract from the option seller. And with that exchange, the option buyer has the possibility for potentially big gains. And the option seller has the possibility for potentially big losses. Weirdly unbalanced, I know. But given this setup and structure, time's relationship with extrinsic value should make sense to you now. I'm an option seller. I'm taking all the risk in this trade. You want me to take all that risk for an increased amount of time? Okay, but it's going to cost you. 
the contract that you want to buy from me is going to be more expensive. It's going to be more expensive because its extrinsic value will have risen because of the added time. And similarly, if there were less time, then the extrinsic value will be lower because now the seller, me in this situation, I'm holding all the risk for a shorter amount of time. So the cost of that option, the extrinsic value in that option is going to be less to reflect that lower amount of time. All right, so now let's turn our attention to volatility. And given all the work that we've just done with time, the relationship between volatility, specifically implied volatility, and extrinsic value should be fairly straightforward to grasp. Here, let's say you're the option seller. You're the option seller because you've been watching my content and you now realize that this is the only way. Nicely done, sir or madam. Well, ceteris paribus, would you prefer to sell an option in a stock with higher volatility or lower volatility? Lower volatility, of course. You're taking all the risk. So you would much prefer to sell an option contract in a stock that doesn't really move around that much, that's a little bit more predictable, that's a little bit more gradual in the moves and the changes that it makes, as opposed to something that's a real mover, that's a real shaker, that's a real bouncer, and it can do a whole lot of damage in a hurry. Plot twist. As some of my more experienced traders that might be watching today, you already know that with higher implied volatility, it might actually lead to more opportunities. It might actually lead to more potential profitability. That is all true, of course, but we are just laying down the cornerstones of the building here today. Therefore, if implied volatility goes up, then extrinsic value has to go up because the seller has to be compensated for a stock that can really move and potentially do a lot of damage. But of course, if implied volatility goes down, then extrinsic values have to go down. If for no other reason, there's now less risk to the seller of the option contract. All right, so that's time and that's volatility in short order, mind you. Let's now turn our attention to maybe one that's not quite as obvious as time and volatility. Let's talk about the stock price and the strike price and how they impact extrinsic value. Now, some of you out there might be thinking, Jim, bruh. I'm not sure that the word that I would use to describe our little time and volatility chats that we just had would be obvious. It may not be my go-to choice. Fair enough, but this next one, it's probably the bumpiest of the three. So to make our work today a little bit easier, I've actually coined my own term, the proximity effect. Now this term, this idea is designed to capture both the stock price and the strike price and kind of lump them together in this combined proximity effect. Now, this is just my own term. You're not going to find this outside of this video. You're not going to find this outside of this channel or outside of my content. So don't go Googling it, hoping to find some more information about proximity effects because it's just going to lead you back to a live feed of this very show. But that's actually exactly what the option pricing model, the Black Shoals model is trying to do with the stock price and the strike price. It's trying to figure out, like based on the proximity of these two variables, how close are they together? How far apart might they be? What should the impact on extrinsic value be? And simply put, it goes like this. The closer the stock price is to the strike price, the stronger the proximity effect, and the higher the extrinsic value will be as a result of that stronger proximity effect. Conversely, the further away the stock price is from the strike price, the weaker the proximity effect, and the lower the extrinsic value should be as a result of that weaker proximity effect. And the easiest way to understand why this is the case is to go back to, no surprise to anyone, the beginning of the option contract, the buyer and the seller. And the best case scenario for each side basically works out as follows. The option buyer wants the option to go in the money and deep in the money at that. The option seller wants the option to go or stay out of the money and deep out of the money, if at all possible. All right, so suppose we're looking at an option that is 10 points out of the money. It's selling for some price and it has some amount of extrinsic value in it. Now look at an option that is only five points out of the money it is going to have more extrinsic value than an option that was 10 points out of the money. Why is that the case? 
Well, one way to understand this is if the option is only five points out of the money, it is now closer to being in the money, what the option seller does not want. So there's a greater likelihood that it eventually gets to that point being in the money. So the option seller has to be compensated for that added risk by way of greater extrinsic value. Similarly, if the option were only two points out of the money, it would have even more extrinsic value than an option that were five points out of the money, which had even more extrinsic value than an option that was 10 points out of the money. And of course, if the option were actually at the money, it would have the most amount of extrinsic value more than being two points out of the money, more than being five points out of the money, and more than being 10 points out of the money. And of course, just to be really clear, all of this can be done and looked at in reverse as well. So rather than going out of the money and then inching closer to at the money, you can start at the money and then move out of the money and you will see lower and lower and lower extrinsic values. Thus, the proximity effect gets stronger and stronger the closer an out of the money option moves to being at the money. And the proximity effect gets weaker and weaker the further out of the money an option goes and gets away from being at the money. That's how stock prices and strike prices impact extrinsic values. Now that's pretty good for our understanding of the proximity effect. So we're gonna leave it at that for today. But a quick little sidebar, as some of my overachievers out there might have picked up on. This whole idea of thinking about the proximity effect and processing the proximity effect by looking through the lens of the option seller and the risk that the option might go in the money, it works really well when you're out of the money and you're moving closer to being at the money. It doesn't work as well when you're in the money and trying to look at an option relative to being at the money. That's because using our same strand of logic, at least in the way that we've presented it today, you would expect extrinsic values to rise the deeper and deeper in the money you go because there's effectively more and more and more risk to the option seller, at least in a sense. This is quite complicated, but it doesn't work that way. That's not what you find. The extrinsic value is actually at its maximum point at the at the money strike. It drops off on both sides of the market, both out of the money and in the money. And we'll explain why that is on the in the money side another time. But hopefully today with option pricing models and Black Scholes models and intrinsic values and extrinsic values and times and volatilities and proximity effects, you have a good foundation for beginning to understand option pricing. And if you're wondering right now, like Jim, my guy, this lopsided relationship between option buyers and option sellers doesn't make any sense to me. Like the option buyer could bank huge gains and the option seller could get stuck with huge losses. Why would anyone in their right mind ever consider selling an option? Man, I am so glad you asked that because coming up next, here's exactly why you should sell options. I'll see you there.